Okie dokie, welcome to the Dragonflight Balance Druid Guide. Um, today I'm going to be talking about some of the most important things that you need to know about Dragonflight Moonkin. Thank goodness this expansion we don't have, you know, Covenants, Legendaries, Conduits, Soulbinds, all of these Auxiliary Borrowed Power Systems. So this expansion should be shorter than previous ones for this video guide. Thank goodness. Um, there's still definitely some things that we need to talk about. I have some sims to show, um, just some kind of things to talk through, and uh, just kind of what you're going to be looking to do. Obviously, all of this stuff is has potential to change. I think that this this tier more than ever, there is going to be class tuning going into the expansion, even uh, through the first couple of weeks of the expansion. I would highly recommend checking written guides on either Wowhead or Icy Veins. Those should always be up to date. And if you want the most like dank and the most cringe under the table builds of all time, you should check the Dream Broke Compendium. That shit, they always have some really high tech builds the <laughs> cutting edge technology in the dream growth compendium but for the wild head and the icy vein stuff that's more for like broader general use now uh i think that things regarding talents are liable to change with like a couple of points obviously i think that every single day i get pinged with a new talent build and there are a couple of points that end up changing here and there it ends up it ends up like uh becoming a little bit different but it's not overall going to be too much different i will say I don't think anything massive is going to change like fundamentally with Moonkin builds though. And so we can kind of talk about through, talk through like what some of the high value points are and kind of what you should be looking to expect with some of your builds. But before we talk about talents, I think let's talk about gear, stats, consumables, that kind of thing. So first off, Haste Mastery is a surprise to absolutely nobody. It's still our best stat, you know. On the Wildhead Guide, I have a Biss list, but like Biss lists are pretty misleading. I would recommend using like Raidbot's top gear to sim specific gear profiles versus one another. But you're looking for haste and mastery on a lot of your gear. Critical Strike is like our third stat, and then Versatility is like a, uh, I don't want to say a decent bit behind, but everything is a decent bit behind both haste and mastery, with mastery being the top stat. For trinkets, you know, um, trink trinkets are actually a very interesting discussion point so for single target it's uh furious rage feather and whispering incarnate icon i think in this first season so whispering incarnate icon comes from primal council and then furious rage feather i think comes from knock it offensive this uh furious rage feather is definitely a very strong passive trinket but you may notice that we were playing two passive trinkets which means like if you do get uh, like a, a conjured chill globe early or something like that um, or you get like a spiteful storm trinket, that kind of thing. You can um, utilize like on use trinkets, you know, fairly reliably. Or if you want to use like a dark moon deck inferno, that kind of thing. And so, like if if you want like a crafted trinket, that that could be of decent value, especially on single target. For AOE, it's uh, whispering incarnate icon is still very very powerful. So we're definitely looking to have that at least in its current state. And then obviously it's other passive uh, passive like stat proc trinkets. Alchemist Stone looks fairly solid. Infernal Rit's not bad. This is from Court of Stars. Um, you know, Contra Chill Robe's still not terrible. Overall, it's a bit of a different situation than what we had in Shadowlands where you were always looking to run one on-use trinket at pretty much all times because our burst damage was so good. Now our burst damage is a lot more smooth. Um, we're basically saying we don't really have that much burst damage. And so like our damage over, over like a five-minute sim is a very flat amount compared to a lot of other specializations and with that being the case we don't really value on use trinkets as high as we did previously now they're not bad if they're overtuned but they're not something that you should be like super sweating over so enchants i think are pretty straightforward so if it's sophic devotion for weapon mastery for rings you want like int and avoidance on slots that it works on so i think it's like boots you can get like stamina you know i think there's like a an avoidance enchant for your cape that kind of thing so you want the you want those on slots that they work on generally gems are going to be like one of these eliminated diamonds that's uh 75 primary stat and then 66 mastery the, obviously it's going to be contingent on your stat totals and like how much mastery you have but this, these are generally how it's going to work and then beyond that you want the keen the right for most of your other slots there are some situations where if you have like turbo bis gear like you may be running some of these keen yes emeralds but that's like very infrequently i would make sure that you're just kind of simming yourself to make sure that there's not something weird going on with your gear but more often than not you're running this keen the right which gives you mastery like high amounts of mastery and a low amount of haste and then yeah and then you obviously want the one eliminated diamond. Uh, other stuff in regards to consumables. Elemental potion of ultimate power. They're annoying to get. 
but they're our best potion. Um, I think they're also the only potion we can really use, but they're pretty solid. For files and flasks, it's generally elemental chaos in some situations. And then if they're adds, then you should run Glacial Fury. There are sims that have like static isolation and that kind of stuff. Uh, simming higher whenever they have high amounts of uptime but it seems like for most practical uses elemental chaos should be uh the go-to elemental chaos and glacial fury should be the go-to flasks now is that liable to change is there some points where you may want static empowerment or uh charged isolation depending on the fight maybe is it is it useful for all situations to recommend that probably not Okay, those are all the consumables. I hope that that was, uh, that was kind of rapid fire. Let's talk about talents. There's actually a decent amount to get to talent-wise. I think that first off, I want to show an annotation talk and just kind of talk through kind of what's good and viable and what is, you know, less so, especially from our spec tree because i think the class tree you know you end up running kind of a similar build and we can talk about that in a second but from our spec tree basically all of these uh, things that are marked in red are the talents that you i deem as mandatory basically you're looking to take them in in pretty much every single build um there's no real situation where you're able to get away from that node because of how strong it is the um ones in yellow are generally the choice i don't want to say choice nodes but they're nodes that have potential use cases depending on um what situation you're in and, and stuff like that they're not taken in all spots but these are the nodes that you kind of uh, select to round out your build and depending on like damage profiles or where they're useful these are going to be good the green nodes are just god awful i think they i have described them as a never select kind of node and so these are unfortunately at the bottom of our tree with things like denizens friends of the Fae. Well, okay friends of the Fae is not bad but Dennis friends of the Fae is bad because denizens are awful uh warrior balloon radiant moonlight those are the nodes that are awful stellar innervation terrible umbral intensity never take those those nodes are always the the green ones where you're just like okay so i never take these then the blue ones are obviously the utility one light of the sun is just probably the worst node in the game force of nature has some situational use particularly in m plus and then you know if you need if you need to interrupt solar beam is the the node the I think the damage loss on Solar Beam ends up being around the four to six percent mark, depending on situation, damage profiles, that kind of thing. But uh, you know, it's sometimes you have to take it. You need to interrupt in some situations. Okay, so let's talk about the generic raid build for Munkin. So actually, first off, I want to talk about the class, the class tree, real quick. The class tree, this build that we're running on the class tree, is um, what I will say is like pretty generally fairly strong uh, the big deal with the class tree is like you really want to go up this left side and be taking things like well honed instincts uh, because this is actually one of our uh, strongest defensive traits you also want to be taking thick hide as that's also one of our stronger defensive traits verdant heart is not bad if you're able to squeeze some points in for that but then obviously we do have some mandatory damage talents with nurturing instinct and like Kara's teachings things like renewal nature's vigil and innervate have a uh, pretty strong use but like our class tree for balance you know it's it's fairly well rounded there are some situations where you need things like remove corruption and whatnot and so that that can be practical in some aspects now you need to um now you really need to think about like where where you're going to be getting like defensive value from and like valuing these high defensive nodes is something that you should be absolutely looking to do but our utility in the um class tree is fairly strong and i think that we're going to end up running like a very similar build for most content where you end up getting it at least one point minimum in a well honed instincts now let's talk about single target raid talents um this right here is the current iteration of the single target raid talent build and so what you may notice immediately is that it has things i think the big two things to talk about is for one it has convoke the spirits and for two it has astral communion I think that this is not exactly particularly useful for most situations. Um, so here's the, deal, the, here's the deal with this build. It's good on Patrick single target, but really falls off once you start adding additional ads because you're not taking things like mushrooms. Um, you are taking things like Convoke, which are almost exclusively single target focused. You also have Denizens of the Dream, which we talked about earlier, are not exactly great. So I also think that this is a node that I have seen 
uh, be selected and deselected maybe 100 times, but it's something that like this, this build in general is not something that you're going to use all too often. As it currently stands, there is only one patchwork fight in the raid in Taros. And so I think that would you play something like this for Taros? Yeah, that's most likely going to be the case. Are you going to play this build or something like this on many fights? No. Now let's talk about a generic raid build that I think is going to um, typically be fairly strong. Like I have, I have all these builds on Wowhead as well um, that, so that you can copy them and you can kind of look at them yourself and then talk about some of the strengths in them. But just as it, and obviously things are liable to change with this kind of thing. I, I, we, we move around, whenever I talked about the annotated node, nodes earlier, talking about like, they're, are they ever taken, that kind of thing. It's some of the situations where like, um, the nodes move around a lot. And so the, the, the most optimal build also changes as those things kind of change. Additionally, it also can change with hot fixes or bug fixes on tuning. But as it currently stands, this is what I would describe as like a generally fairly strong raid build. And um, this generally fairly strong raid build revolves around like having things like mushrooms for a lot of cleave because there are a lot of fights that have ads that spawn uh, periodically in the fight. These are things like Aranog. These are things like Senarth. You know, Primal Council is a literal council fight. Um, Broodkeeper is a full AoE boss. A lot of bosses have ads that spawn, and so you're going to want things like mushrooms. In addition to that, this means that things like uh, Convoke are less good. I even tried Convoke on Kura Grim Totem, or I was simming even Convoke on Kura Grim Totem, and then I realized that, for one, Convoke had worse priority damage, while at the same time, it was just substantially worse on uh, AoE whenever you had to two-target cleave. And so I feel like you're going to be playing Incarn most of the raid just due to the power that you're getting um, from Incarn. In addition to that, I think that Pulsar is going to be almost universally selected. I did see that there was like some points where... Okay, so say that there is something that lines up on a two-minute interval and you think that, okay, I can get great value out of the Incarn cooldown reduction that I would gain from Orbital Strike. I think that is a potential use case for orbital strike in raid but it's not a super strong one i know that on kuro grim totem he was having intermissions spawn at least in during our testing starting at two minutes and depending on how the intermissions work you could potentially play it on something like that but now is it is it going to ever really sim that high is it going to be universally very good probably not but th those are just kind of the situations that you're looking at for this raid build i think that this raid build is is pretty strong giving the context of what vault of the incarnates looks like for moonkin now i think that there is a high chance that I take one point and move it somewhere else later, or uh, I sit there and I'm like kind of sweating some of these decisions. I would look at like, I know Wowhead does this boss guide thing and I end up recommending like different builds and that kind of stuff. Um, now there are a couple of times like you will put like one point into here and there to kind of optimize or round out a build that you uh, lose less things on. So say like this firmament point, it seems like it's like super movable. If you instead wanted like Goldrin for whatever reason, because you thought that was going to be slightly better because you're actually star searching a decent amount with this build, then you, I, can see you, I can see you dropping firmament for Goldrin if you thought it was good. That kind of thing. Um, additionally, there are things like ethereal kindling points and whatnot that uh, can change kind of depending on what's going on. Now, let's talk about M plus builds and their differences. I, I think that, so as it currently stands, um, Mythic plus builds are in kind of a weird spot. I think that overall M plus builds, you have two kind of competing builds. First off, there's not much, you, you, you probably see right here that there is not really much that changes in, in the talents that I have whenever I'm clicking between these two builds. One of the things that does change though is Orbital Strike. And uh, the two big builds right now are Orbital Strike versus Pulsar. And whenever I was looking at Sims of this earlier, Orbital Strike came down to being around a 2% damage loss. So Orbital Strike, what it does is it reduces the cooldown of your Incarn by 60 seconds, and then it fires off and shoots uh, and applies Stellar Flare to all targets. Now in Sims, uh, they're, they're super optimal with their Stellar Flare usage. They're also super optimal with um, just being able to have their Pulsar procs. You know, they're never missing. Uh, the Pulsar procs isn't going to like fizzle out at the end of a pull like happens to basically everybody who's played the game as a moonkin so on a practical level orbital strike is a lot easier to play around than pulsar is it now i think that is orbital strike going to be able to get you two percent overall damage on a lot of aoe situations while at the same time being slightly worse than single target i don't think the answer i, I think the answer is likely no but I do think that if you want to play Orbital Strike, you are not 
completely trolling yourself. I think that you can play it, and if you think that you're getting good value out of the 60 uh, seconds cooldown on Incarn, and you think that you're getting good value out of... Um, and you think that you're getting good value out of the... Um, Stellar Flare application, I was looking for the word there, then that's absolutely going to happen. Now, the, one of the bigger differences too is with this build is like a Pulsar, you actually really want to play a Loon's Guidance, whereas Orbital Strike, you have point, you have like an additional point to kind of uh, throw around. I think that I ended up putting an Infirmament here. I think that's where it ended up landing. So yeah, I mean, there's also things like Nature's Balance that are pretty pretty decent value in M+, if you want the the rebalancing to 50 Astral Power as, as opposed to Depleting. That could, that could be uh, seen as kind of useful. I think that overall though, um, I also have annotations on the Wowhood guy talking about like what exactly is uh, good good value points in M plus and what exactly are just points that you should be looking to avoid in in almost all situations. I forgot to draw two lines. I see this grayed out, but this should be red and this should be red. But yeah, that's basically how the M plus one goes down. So there's also a question of like one versus two points of ethereal kindling. I think that I'm a one point ethereal kindling enthusiast. Ultimately, it depends on like how long your trash packs are going to last and how long the uh, how sustained the AOE is. Um, I think that whenever I was looking at Sims earlier, it was something in the order of like anything over 45 seconds. The second point of ethereal kindling was slightly better, and you would be looking to get a different point elsewhere. Now that's not something that happens all too often. Like uh, things that pulls that last over 45 seconds are not all too common, but for things like Primal Council, it's it's really good. So. I think that I think that you could justify a second point of three-year-old kindling and not be too bad, um, too bad off with it. Now I, I do think that one point is a little bit better as well because it's, it's going to help you round out your overall M plus damage because you get like single target damage, whereas this is only relative to Starfall. But that's uh, that's just how it goes. Rotation. I think the rotation is actually very simple at a super high level. So. At like its core, it's you maintain Moonfire and Sunfire at all times, and you always dot before Eclipse. Then you get in, then uh, like this is this is a situation where you always dot before Eclipse. There is no situation where, especially on AOE, where you are looking to get into Eclipse and then dot. Maybe there's a spot where, like, if a tank is grouping a trash pack in M plus or something like that, I would just be mashing Moonfire um, because you have twin moons, and so it's able to bounce before I would be looking to um, get into Eclipse. But I, I think that there are some situations where you're. Like if you're firing off wraths, pre-pull, that kind of thing, it doesn't really matter too much. Uh, you want to get into Eclipse, then after after Moonfiring and Sunfiring all the mobs, because you want to activate your mastery, because our mastery's changed, by the way, you want to then get into Eclipse as soon as possible. Currently, you're prioritizing Lunar Eclipse for all situations because of how Starfire is, and just, just know that you always are prioritizing Lunar Eclipse. Then after that, looking to not cap Astro Power, st you Star Surge single target of priority mobs, and you Starfall AOE starting at two targets and it's also notable that starfall now stacks and so you're able to put more than one out at a time additionally you press your builder starfire is the best in slot builder you you pretty much press that as your builder at all times the only situation that you would be pressing wrath is whenever you are inside of celestial alignment on single target all t beyond that the only time we're pressing wrath is to get back into lunar uh, lunar eclipse for talent interactions Let's say that most talent interactions just involve you pressing those buttons on CD whenever you're talking about it in the context of the rotation. And so things, these are things like Astral Communion, Fury of Balloon, you know, Mushrooms. Like you're pressing all these just like on cooldown. Even on the wild guys, it's just like use as often as possible. It's good AP generation. Slam Astral Communion whenever you're low on Astral Power. Like those kind of things, you're literally just uh, pressing them as often as possible. No real reason to hold them for like there are situations where you would pull them or hold them for specific encounters, but that's like a decision based like a decision making thing. It's not like an, a damage optimization thing. So the talents that do kind of change our rotation are Stellar Flare, Star Lord, Rattle Stars, and Waning Twilight. Those are the only talents that actually change how you play. And I had to write about three out of the four of these on the Wowhead guide because I thought that they warranted um, writing about. First off, let's talk about Flare because I think this is the one that is um, the most complicated to speak on. So Flare, you play it in all situations. So on single target, it's super intuitive. You just maintain 100% uptime on it. Not really too much going on with it. On AoE, Flare is a bit weird. And so you do plus Flare on AoE, but it's a pretty low priority um, ability. The only thing that it's lower priority than is unbuffed Starfire on AoE. So non two set buff Starfire and non... Umbral Embrace, is that the name of the stupid talent? Yeah, non-Umbral Embrace buffed Starfire. And so that's the only thing that it's um, uh, 
That's the only thing that's higher priority then is non-buffed Starfire. Beyond that, you would press your Starfire. This does result in you Stellar Flaring a lot. You end up Stellar Flaring up to, until like 20 mobs if you can afford the globals and you and that kind of thing and you have enough uh, target count and the pack is lasting long enough you're, you're going to flare basically as many targets as you reasonably can this is due to the astral power generation just from the stellar flare talent um because it, it does dip, generate you eight astral power which is pretty good on top of that it gives you more orbital breaker and shooting stars procs there are some situations where you don't cast stellar flare but that's on like aoe trash packs and m plus that last less than 30 seconds my general advice is to kind of just like play around with flare and you kind of get a hang of what mobs that you're going to be looking to dot so like on a poll say algathar academy has like a lot of um mobs that are are going to die fairly fast but then that also in some of the parts of algathar academy with those mobs that die fast they have a lot of they don't have a lot but they have a couple of high hp mobs and you'll learn with time what mobs you should be flaring early on and what mobs you probably don't want to flare that they're, they're not going to be worth um putting it on you'll get the hang of it and i think that just playing around with it is going to be the best uh way for you to deal with it star lord and rattle is a bit weird basically you only play around min uh, maximizing uptime on three stack star lord you're you're pretty good as long as you do not ignore star lord and only look at rattle it's one of those situations that that rattle the stars you would think that oh okay i should only be playing around rattle the stars and my star lord uptime will be sufficient this is not necessarily the case um there is also a thing where so so if you only prioritize star lord it's it's pretty good damage now if you if you keep star lord and rattle the stars at the same prio it is it is slightly better and what that ends up doing is what same prio does oh yeah i have it in my, i have it in my notes what same prio does is it dumps it dumps to get star lord stacks as soon as possible but it still uses surge to keep rattle up even if it's suboptimal for star lord that's what same prio does that is slightly better damage so you can min max it as you wish if you only want to look at star lord you're not going to be losing that too much damage Oh, okay. Waning Twilight. Waning Twilight was the last talent that I wanted to talk about because it does kind of change your rotation, but it's really easy. Most of the time, you're playing Flare, so you have Waning Twilight uptime. That's just kind of the, the situation where it does happen. The only alternative thing you would ever need to do is... So say you're playing Waning Twilight in M+, for whatever reason. Say it becomes meta, and you do have Mushrooms, and you don't want to just like slam all of your Mushrooms down at once. You want to kind of, uh, with the Fungal Growth Dot... You want to kind of drag out that fungal growth dot to make sure that you have higher uptime on your waning twilight on all of the mobs, especially if you don't have everything flared already. If you have everything flared, then it doesn't really matter. But say it's like a, a 10 target pull and you just hadn't had the opportunity to flare everything yet and you, and you need to press a mushroom, then you want to like not press all of them at once. You want to kind of drag it out for waning twilight buff uptime. Tier sets. Our tier set is incredibly strong. So... So our two set is Star Surge and Starfall increase the damage of your next Wrath and Starfire by 20%, stacking up to three times. Our four set is whenever you enter Eclipse, your next Star Surge or Starfall costs no Astral Power and deal 35% increased damage. Our two set and four set, or our four set in particular, but our two set and our four set together are some of the strongest in the game at around somewhere between 14 and 16% uh, damage gained. You know, it's a bit high. It's one of those situations that's actually kind of scary whenever you look at it, because if you don't have your tier set, then you're going to feel like shit. But if you do have your tier set, you're actually going to do competitive amounts of damage. Uh, so it's a very, very important tier set to get. It's fun to play around. I think the only thing that I would say... It, so you need to track your two set to make sure that you're not capping over the three times. In addition to that, kind of optimizing getting into eclipses is important. Um, now you may ask, okay, whenever you enter Eclipse, am I supposed to use the 35% buff Star Surge or am I supposed to use the Starfall? The answer is in pretty much every single situation, you use the free Starfall because it, as it as it turns out, 50 Astral Power is better than 40 Astral Power for a free spender. Last thing I had was macros. I, didn't, I don't really want to spend too much time on macros, and I think I want to get this video at, done as fast as I reasonably can. The de here's, here's the deal with macros. I think the only macro that you need to know is there's an Orbital Strike macro. Um, you want to do slash cast at cursor for Celestial Alignment. Beyond that, Wowhead has... Uh, you know, macros for mouse to over innervate, that kind of thing. You can go and look at those yourself. But I think the only macro that really changed and that you might want is now a orbital strike, like at cursor macro to make sure that you don't have to like use the reticle itself. Okay, beyond that, I think that's going to be it for the balanced druid guide. Again, go check out Wowhead for any updates. Uh, you can check out Dreamgrove GG Compendium as well. Check out Icy Veins for any updates as well. 
Hope you guys enjoy it. I'm excited for Dragonflight Moonkin. Really, really excited to see how it does and hope it gets buffs soon. Goodbye.